welcome to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center podcast. We hope that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now here's a word from Pastor Jen Cobray. Well, I'm going to get down on my knees and pray. I need God, but you obviously need, you know, you need God too. And so we'll go before the Lord and, and let's pray and let's believe God that God, before we do, does anybody want the word of God today? Yeah. I mean, are, we, are, we, are we okay with that? Um, so we're going to look into the word of the Lord. It's going to be great. So stand to your feet. And let's go before the Lord. Let's deposit our hearts in his hands. Father, we just come to you in the name of Jesus, giving you all the praise, glory, and all the honor. How good it is to be in the house of the Lord. Thank you, Father, for this great opportunity we have to hear your word. Lord, you, Jesus, set us free but the word will make us free. And we're just so grateful that we get to every time we come into the house of God, hear from the teacher of the church, who's not a man, not a woman, but it's the Holy Spirit. So welcome, Holy Spirit. Touch us, heal us, strengthen us, encourage us, guide us, guard us, direct us, and motivate us to be all that you would have us to be. And Lord, we'll give you the praise, glory, and all the honor. How good, how grateful we are. Now, Lord, we lift up all the churches in the Inland Empire as well as around the planet. Because if you're going to bless us, we want you to bless them too. If they're preaching and hearing the gospel, then they're our brothers and our sisters. We want you to bless them. So bless our Baptist brothers, Lutherans, Methodists, Episcopalian, Charismatics, Pentecostals. Thank you for Calvary Chapels and Harvest Oak Valley and Oasis, Inland Christian Center, the Assemblies of God, Four Square Denomination. We thank you, Father, for all the great things you're doing with our Adventist brothers and sisters, the Catholic brothers and sisters. Bless Trinity, Emmanuel, Ecclesia, Church, Lord, the Way, San Bernardino Temple. Just bless all the churches that are preaching the gospel. And Lord, we'll give you the praise, give you the glory. At no time do we think of ourselves as better than them, but we see ourselves as co-laborers, workers together in one field, building one kingdom, not a man's, but yours. And God will give you the praise, give you all the glory. In Jesus' mighty name, with a great big shout, we all say amen. amen. <clears throat> Something miraculous is going to happen right now. Are you ready? Turn with me to Hebrews, the fifth chapter. <laughs> You're very, very bad, you know that. For those of you that don't know what I just did, we, we go line and find line, precept by precept of the word of God. I mean, we're not in any hurry. This is like good food. You don't want to just wolf it down, you know, and, and uh, you, you know, just eat it too fast. It's so good, you want to savor every moment of it. And the fourth chapter was like power packed. I honestly don't know how long we were in the fourth chapter. I'm guessing somewhere between nine months and a year. Did you know that most churches you go to, if they teach the book of Hebrews, four lessons on Hebrews, that's all you're getting. Here we are one year, and one, in fact, I don't even know how long, we are in the 16th verse of the fourth chapter. Let me just be honest with you, though. This is shocking. This is a shocking statement. You want to hear a shocking statement? Here's a shocking statement. We just scratched the surface of what God's word is saying. It's like it's so rich and so deep that it's in layers. And if you understand that, my job is not just to teach you the word, but to teach you the character, nature, and attributes of God as we get the word of God. Give you an illustration of what I just said. I can say something to you and you can hear my words, but when you see how much passion or emotion or how important it is by body language, then all of a sudden the words that I spoke to you become amplified by what I expressed to you with my whole being. And a lot of times we look at the word of God on a superficial level instead of looking at the word of God, seeing the very character, nature, and attributes of the Lord behind the word of God, with the very passions of God, what God's really saying. And uh, it's tremendous when you do that, and all of a sudden the word of God becomes alive. He wrote it that way. You ought to be able to understand it that way, and it's exciting when you get it. We happen to be in the wonderful text of Hebrews. We're in the fifth chapter. Now, I want you, if you have a seatbelt next to you, you ought to fasten it because you're, this is amazing in itself. Your first miracle is we're in the sixth chapter, fifth chapter. Second miracle is we're going five verses. 
in one time. I mean, that in itself is like amazing. Let me read them to you before I give you the title of the message because it's important for you to get a hold of this. This is so important, but you're going to have to listen, if you will, to the beginning of this real strong so that you can hook on to where we're going and what we're doing. I'll read to you, then I'll come back and give you the title. Here's chapter number five, Hebrews, verse number one. For every high priest is taken from among men, is appointed for men. You ought to take your Bible out and where it says appointed for men, you ought to circle it in your Bible. In other words, there's something that they are to do. They're not just high priests to be a high priest. There's something they're there for. And he's talking about the contrast, and listen to this, between the human high priest and the eternal high priest. The human high priest is like in the bloodline of Aaron that were the high priests, they were men. And then you'll find that there's an eternal high priest, his name is Jesus. The beauty of the whole thing is Jesus is the preeminent one. That means greater than, more wonderful, more magnificent than any other previous high priest. The reason it was written is because the people in those days were putting a great emphasis, if you will, on the high priest within the temple, missing the very high priest of all high priests, whose name is Jesus. We oftentimes do that too. We get hooked into religion and ceremonial rituals of men. And we forget about what this is really all about. It's really about a relationship with the greatest high priest, the preeminent one, Jesus Christ. But it's even greater than that. And I'm going to show you that in just a moment as we take a look at it. So circle those words pointed for men in things pertaining to God, that he may offer both gifts and sacrifices for sin, verse number two, that he can have compassion on those who are ignorant and go astray, since he himself is subject to weakness. Now, he makes the statement that the human high priest had feelings for other people because he knew what it was like to fail. He knew what it was like, you know, to uphold the standard and make a mistake. He knew what it was like, and he had compassion on, on the other people. Verse number three, because of this he was required as the people, so also for himself to offer sacrifices for sins. So he has something to do. This human high priest was, if you will, called by God and chosen by God to do something. And then it goes on in verse number four, and it says that no man takes this honor on himself. In other words, he didn't just put it on himself. He didn't come along and say, well, I'm a high priest. Uh, you better listen to me. Here's my business card. I've made myself a high priest. Oftentimes, what we don't see in this is the truth that we make ourselves something that we're really not, and then we find ourselves in trouble. So verse number four comes along, uh, verse number five, excuse me, verse number four, no man takes his honor on himself, but he who is called by God. I want you to circle the words called by God. So first, here's this human high priest that's called by God. Now you find that there's another one coming along just after Aaron was. Verse number five. So also Christ did not glorify himself and became high priest, but it was he who said to him. In other words, here's God the Father speaking to the Son, and he makes this statement. You are my son, today I have begotten you. All of a sudden, here's Jesus becoming what God the Father says he is. In other words, you will find there's a scenario taking place between the high priest earthly and the high priest heavenly Jesus. They're both chosen, they're both called, and they're both commissioned. Let me put that up on the overhead for you. They're both chosen, they're called, and commissioned. In other words, there's a purpose for them to be a high priest. Now, we can go on and study about that all you want, but what has that got to do with you? You just need to understand that's the way it is, that God calls the human high priest, chose the human high priest, and commissioned the high priest to do a job. You will find that Jesus was, if you will, chosen. He was called, and then he is commissioned to do a job. Without understanding that, you will never see the third high priest. The third priest that we're talking about is you. And a lot of times people don't understand the importance of what I'm about to say to you. The scripture itself calls you very, very important people. You don't feel like a priest, 
You don't feel like things. In fact, the book of Revelation, let me put it up on the overhead for you, and Revelation makes this statement, calls you kings and priests. And he has made us, listen to this, kings and priests. You, if you're born of the Spirit of God, are not just somebody who goes to church. Here's the point. You're not just somebody who sings a song. You're not somebody who lives a nice little goody two-shoe life. There's actually a commissioning that takes place that puts you in a position. And the position that he's describing out of the words of the Lord Jesus Christ are amazing. Number one, he calls you king. And number two, he calls you priest. Did you know the highest physical authority on the planet was a king in the days of written? The highest spiritual authority on the planet was the priest. Did you know that you take the place of the highest spiritual and physical authority on the planet. Did you know that most people who attend American churches have no concept of that? They just come in, they just sing a song, they go out, live their own little normal life, and that's fine. But guess what? How sad is that the word of God makes it very clear that you are called by God to be kings and priests. You are also, if you will, chosen, called, and commissioned to do something. One more time, you and I, are chosen, called, and commissioned to do something. If you don't know what it is that God's called you to do, if you don't know how it works, how it operates, and who you really are in the eyes and in the heartbeat and in the plans of God, you will only live out the life that you know. May I say this to you? Let me give you an illustration. If I was to build a boat and I put the boat together, I built all the wood, I put it in the shop, the boat building shop, and I, you know, I painted it up. I built all the wood on there. Everything was great. All the wenches were great. My jib sail out in front was doing great. Main sheet's doing great. My mast boom was doing great. Got all my rudders in place. Got all my sailing vessels. I'm ready to sail. It's a sailboat. Is it a sailboat? Absolutely. But what if I never took it out of the boat building shop and took it to the ocean? Then that which was built was good for nothing. It never got the job done. Let me put it in terms like this for most people in the body of Christ. It's like an automobile. A guy goes to the shop in his garage and he buys uh, all the parts for the most and fastest automobile he could possibly ever build. It's a racing vehicle. He buys the most effective motor there is. He buys the best carburation system there could possibly be. He buys a manifold system that's far beyond any expectation of men. He has it worked on, puts in, keeps it light. It's the fastest machine going, it'll go, it'll fly, it'll go fast, but he leaves it in the garage and he never does anything with it. Is it a race car? Yes, but it'll never race until someone gets out and makes it race. Most of the body of Christ are like that. They're kings and priests and don't know it. Therefore, they never get out and do what they need to do and that's a shame because therefore the commission of the Lord Jesus Christ is never followed through and never commissioned. So when I look at this and I see the kings of, uh, excuse me, the priests of old and then I see the priest Jesus who is the preeminent one, then I stop and think about what about us? How can God use us? What does God want from us? How does God want us to deal with this? What's this all about? I don't want to live my life ignorant, do you? I don't want to say to God someday, well, you know, I did the best I could when in fact that's not the best you could. You could have done more by getting in and finding out what it is that God's commissioned you to do. God has commissioned you. Sure, you're going to have a family. Sure, you're going to raise your children. Sure, you're going to love your wife or your husband, buy a house, buy a nice car, go on vacation. But guess what? I want you to hear me now. That's part of living life and God wants you to do it. But God also has has a commission on you to do something. You are the voice of God, the hands of God, the heart of God to a lost and dying world. You are, for the people that are going to hell, the priest that's going to show the way of the Lord Jesus Christ. Somebody ought to give me a great big amen. Did you know that the Bible says you have the ministry of reconciliation? In other words, God says you are the one that that's what a priest does. He brings heaven and earth together and stands in the gap. That ministry of reconciliation, bringing God and man together. You'll also find that you yourself are ambassadors of Christ. That's what a priest is, that they represent God in heaven, speaking the oracles of God in heaven to a lost and dying generation. You are the ambassadors of Christ. 
And for each and every one of us, I want you to hear this. God has chosen you. If you're born of the Spirit of God, if you're not, we'll take care of that before today's out. But if you're born of the Spirit of God, God has chosen you. Not only has God chosen you, God has called you. Not only has God has called you, God has uh, commissioned you to do something. Now, who is it that God uses? Very important for us. Because here's the title of today's message. God chose, choice is you. God, choice is you. He's not looking for someone else. He's looking for you. Can you imagine? You may have been rejected by your parents. You may have been rejected by a loved one. You may have been rejected by family. You may have been rejected by your boss. You may have been rejected by the military service. You may have been rejected from your job. But I've got news for you. God, the creator of the heavens and the earth, looks at you. And he, if you're born of the spirit of God, has chosen you. And he will give you an assignment or commission you to be something valuable upon the place of earth. And therefore, God wants to use you in a mighty way. Somebody ought to say amen. God can use those that. Those are the words that God's going to say. God can use those that. Four things today that God can use. If you're not in line with these, let's get in line with them. If you're do them, then look for God's assignment on you to wherever you're at. Because God wants to use you as a priest to the people around you. To stand in the gap for the people and let them know about Jesus Christ. God can use those, number one that separate from the world. I don't know if you understand what I'm saying. We're in the world, but we're not of the world. We don't get our direction from the world. We don't get our passions from the world. We don't make decisions based on the vanity of man, but we make decisions based on the wisdom of God. And you and I have got to come to a place where we realize that we as Christians have got to separate. We cannot be like the world. I think one of the greatest frustrations in me is I see the churches becoming worldwide more like the world. You walk in, they look like a nightclub instead of a church. They sound like a nightclub. They smell like a nightclub instead of the church. That to me is sad. We don't have to be like a nightclub in order to preach Jesus. We need to preach Jesus because he's Jesus. Are you following me? We don't have to compromise who we are. The world needs to compromise who they are and get right with Jesus. Are you following me? We need to make a stand. We're in the world, but we're not of the world. We don't get direction from the world. We don't get our uh, insight from the world. They don't give us a pattern to follow. We follow Jesus. We get our directions from Jesus. We're not people who are going to listen to the world. We're separate from the world. And if you don't understand what that means, that means you can live a normal life, but there's something special about you. You have a new family. You have a new spiritual DNA. You have a new vision. You have a new hope. You have a new heart. You have a new life ahead of you. But my goodness, the Bible says all things have passed, old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become what? New. And you and I need to realize that we don't have to be like the world. If you're walking on both sides of the fence, today we can change that. But if you're walking on both sides of the fence, may I say this to you? I promise you, it will slip and fall. And when you slip and fall, when you're walking on both sides of the fence, expect the pain of take place. Some of you have been walking on both sides of the fence so long that it's ridiculous and it's time to make the change and stop messing with God. God's called you into a special position. He's washed you with his blood, went to the cross, a beaten bloody mess for you so that you could be something in life and now it's time to do what God would have you to do. Are you listening to what I'm saying? We are people who are separate from the world. We're in it, but we're not of it. Somebody ought to say amen. I love the verse. If I may take you to a verse uh, that amplifies that. In 2 Timothy 1.9 says it like this. Who has saved us and called us with a holy calling. Listen to these words. Who has saved us. He didn't just save you and leave you. He didn't just save you and forget you. 
He didn't just save you and wait now until you get to go to heaven. There's a holy calling. There's something God has for you to do, just like the priests of old, just like the high priests of old. There's something for them to do. There's something for you to do. God wants to use something on the inside of you. Maybe the whole world has come against you and tried to stop you, tried to shut up your mouth, tried to keep you from being what God would have you to be. But I'm here today to tell you that God has a plan for your life. All you got to do is learn how to trust him. Get out of the world and get into Jesus. Come on, somebody. A holy calling. You know that word holy is a great word. It means separate unto God. It means really the way I translated it for you before, exclusively his. Isn't that a peaceful expression? We are exclusively, not the world's, not somebody, we're exclusively his. In other words, we're a people, if you will, that are separated unto him. That's why God comes and says, be ye holy as I am holy. We can be holy because we've been washed by the blood, therefore that we're separated unto him. Jesus said, when you hear my words, they're not my words, but he that sent me. The things that I do are the things that he sent me to do. In other words, when you see Jesus, you see the Father. Well, it's the same thing it ought to be when they see the church. Why? Because we're separated from the world. Let me tell you something else. I'm not telling you not to vote. I'm telling you to vote. But I want you to know something. Personally, I don't give a flip who's in the White House as long as I know who's on the throne. Are you following me? Because... Who's ever in the White House can be as arrogant as they want to be, thinking they're the most powerful men in the free world. But I know one who's the most powerful of the entire world. Are you following me? His name is Jesus. And no matter what happens, I've got Jesus and so do you. We belong to a different kingdom. We've been translated out of the kingdom of darkness and brought into the kingdom of light. Therefore, we are a separate, peculiar people called by the name, by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Is anybody listening? And that's the kind of a person God needs to use. And if you're not separated, we'll separate you today. We'll show you how it works. We're talking about God can use those, number one, that are separated from the world. Number two, God can use those that want to walk worthy. Now, I want you to hear what I said. I said want to walk worthy. I didn't say always walk worthy. We have times when our walk stinks. Do you know what I'm talking about? There's times when we make mistakes. There isn't anybody in here, including Pastor Jim, that hasn't made mistakes. Thank God we get up and keep going with Jesus. We repent, washes us off, and we keep going forward. And guess what? We want to walk worthy. Where I didn't walk worthy before, I walk worthy today because I kept fighting the fight of faith. I may have only walked worthy for a week and then I walked worthy for two weeks and then I walked worthy for three weeks and then I walked worthy for four weeks. But I want you to know something. There came a day when I was walking in that issue. No longer was that a problem because the Word of God had set me free. And we love each other during this process of wanting to walk worthy with God. I love the word of God. It says Ephesians, if you'll go there with me, in the fourth chapter, in verse number one. Ephesians, the fourth chapter, verse number one. Let's pop it up on the overhead for everybody to see. I therefore the prisoner of the Lord. You see the word beseech up there? The word beseech means I beg you. Can you imagine the Holy Spirit coming in your living room, sitting you down and saying, listen, I want to beg you to do something. There would not be one person that says, please, God, you don't have to beg me. I'll just do it. Just ask me. But this is what the Holy Spirit says. I'm begging you to do something. He says that you walk worthy of your what? Calling with which you were called. Thank God 
God's called us. Thank God he's chosen us. Thank God he's commissioned us. And we need to be people that can be used by God like the priests of old and like our eternal priest who was faithful to go to that cross for every single one of us and pay the price. Guess what? Man, that's good news. The reason is because we want to walk worthy. Somebody ought to give the Lord a great big praise. Today I want you to know that God can use those that are going to be great priests onto the world that's lost and falling and failing because he has called us, commissioned us, and, and chosen us. But listen to this, it's so important for us. Number three, God can use those that depend on him. All of us need to know that we need to be dependent on God. Everything we'll ever be, everything we'll ever do, Everything we'll ever say, everything we'll ever become, everything we'll ever accomplish is because of God. Can I tell you something that you've never heard before in your life from a pulpit in America? Not one of you have ever heard a preacher ever tell you this before, but I'm going to tell you the truth. You may like it or may not like it. I'm not saying it to offend you. I am saying it because you've never heard it and it's truth. You and I are stupid. <laughs> and we need God. And anybody that doesn't think he's stupid is double stupid. And by the way, if you think that's an ungodly expression, you need to read your Bible. It's used numbers of times. The word stupid in there referring to people who make mistakes and don't follow God. Let me say it to you like this. God doesn't use people who are smart, pretty, intelligent, degreed. Doesn't use white men, black men, brown men. God doesn't look for the color of a person or a level playing field to get ahead. Not about any of that stuff. It's about how big your God is. This is about how great your God is. I had a man yesterday morning in the front row has three medical degrees, MDs. Thank God he's smart enough to come to church every service. Because he knows, even though he has three medical degrees, he could get very arrogant in how he is thought of in society and social systems. But he knows that everything he is and will ever be is because of the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now that's a wise man, not a stupid man. It's not about your giftings. It's not about your looks. It's not about what family you came from. It's not about what your checkbook says. It's not about what your savings says. It's not about how many degrees you have on the wall. It's not about how much you read, how much you don't read, how much you understand and calculate, gathering data and making conclusions in your life. It's all about how big your God is. And that levels the playing field for everybody. That's the cool thing about this which means that you and I have got to be a dependent people on God, and that's humility. And I've taught you that real humility is not some broke down, busted and disgusted person driving around an old beat up car with a bunch of rock bumper stickers all over it and smoke pouring out of the back of it and everybody says, wow, I want to be like that person. I want you to know something. That's not humility, that's stupidity. Because God wants you to realize it's not about what you have, it's about who lives in you. And his name is Jesus. Are you following me? It's not about how talented you are. It's not about how gifted you are. It's not about whether you can do it or not doing it. The bottom line, when stupid people get together, we can't do it. We need God to come into our midst and he takes all of us stupid people and makes us pretty smart. And that's called humility. And that's called being dependent on him. 
Everybody that's ever used by God, male or female, was somebody who was very dependent on God, needed God. The difference between David and King Saul was simply one had a heart for God because he was dependent on God to make it. The other one thought he could just do it and throw God in a little here and a little there, and it didn't work. And that's why David was so amazingly outstanding because he had a heart for God because he was humble before the Lord. God, I need you to come to my rescue. I'm a mess. In fact, I want to read you a Bible college, one of my favorite verses. 1 Corinthians, the first chapter, verse number 26. Starting in verse 26 of the first chapter of 1 Corinthians, so it's 1, 1, 26. Okay, here we go. 1 Corinthians 1, verse 26. You ought to underline some of these words. For you see your calling, brethren. Oh, here we go. That not many wise according to the flesh and not many mighty, not many noble are called. You would think that God would call the wise guy, the smart one, the noble one, the one that really has it all together. He doesn't. Not many. But God has chosen the foolish things of this world to put to shame the wise. And God has chosen the weak things of this world to put to shame those things which are mighty. Guess what? That's you and I. Not the mighty part. The foolish and the weak. Verse 28. And the base things of this world and the things in which are despised, God has chosen. And the things which are not to bring to nothing those things that are. What for? Verse number 31. Watch this. That as it is written... He who glorifies, let him glory in the Lord. In other words, the bottom line to this, there's nobody that ought to be arrogant at all or conceited at all. Guess what? The bottom line for every single one of us, we have what we have. We're going to attain what we're going to attain. We're going to become what we're going to become. We're going to say what we need to say. We're going to do what we need to do all because of his grace and mercy that works on our behalf. Somebody ought to give me a great big amen. And God can use you in your commission in life if you are dependent on him. Because he resists the proud, which means puts up a wall and stops them in their arrogance and their pride. Verse number four this morning, and God can use those. Number one, you remember, separated from the world. Number two, that want to walk worthy. Number three, that are dependent on him. Number four, that are filled with hope. And I want you to know something. Without hope, you will never see tomorrow better than today. But with hope, you picture every day that tomorrow is going to be better than today. And the reason for that hope has got to be because of the presence of God. When God comes on the scene, your yesterday was okay, today you're going to get by, but tomorrow is going to be better than any day I've ever had in my life. Not based on me, but based on him. Are you hearing me? Hope is when you know that tomorrow is great and the life ahead of you is fantastic. In fact, let me tell you something. I'm two and a half years away from being 70 years old. I have never in my life been filled with more hope than I am now in my life. I have hope for this church. I have hope for my kids. I have hope for my grandkids. I have hope for my business. I have hope for my marriage. I have hope for my, my God's going to take me from good to better, from great to greatness. Then here's why. Because he's a great and mighty and marvelous God. And for me to fail, he would have to fail. You say, wait a minute, pastor. As people get older, they get broken down. Their bodies get stiff. They don't look so good. Their bellies start to stick out. Uh, uh, they start to forget things. They start to realize they're not going to go very far. I'm here to tell you you need to get off of that. I'm here to tell you that it's all about hope. 
The future is not based on whether your joints work well or your back is stiff or your stomach is flat or whether you have hair on your head or don't have hair on your head. Doesn't make one bit a difference. The future is not based on what you look like, move like, think like. The future is based on the King of Glory. His name is Jesus above everything. That's why he says there is nothing impossible to him that believes. We stop ourselves when we lose hope. We stop ourselves when we see tomorrow as a, well, I'll just get by. I want you to know something. Tomorrow can be the greatest day of your life because you've got the greatest God there has ever been. Somebody ought to give him a great big praise. The truth is, without hope, there is no future. You say, you don't know what's been in my past. I know, I know what's in your future. He's seated at the right hand of the Father. The Bible says he's seated at the right hand of the Father. Watch this, watch this. He's seated. And when he sees you in trouble, the Bible says he gets up. He doesn't ache when he gets up. <laughs> oh, my. That's why the Bible says all things are possible to him that believes. Why does he say that if it's not true? You know, it's all things are possible if you're young and smart and rich and famous. All things are possible if you got a great education, your mom and dad were cool. All things are possible if you never made a mistake in your life and you never did drugs or were an addict. All things are possible. No, it didn't say anything. There's no prerequisite to this. All things are possible to him who's got a relationship with Jesus Christ and who believes. Come on, somebody. I got to have hope that God's going to do great, mighty, marvelous things. Ephesians 1:17 and verse number 18, it says these words. It says, that the God of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give to you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him, the eyes of your understanding, the eyes of your understanding, be enlightened that you may know what is the hope of his calling. My goodness sake, saints, hear me now. Tomorrow is filled with him who created the heavens and the earth. And you ought to be excited that tomorrow is going to be the best day of your life. Put your heart on him. Don't let anything rock your boat. And get out of that boat and walk on the water with Jesus Christ. It's true. It's true. Today, you kings and priests, can you imagine that? You've been a little sinning pervert. God has washed you with his blood and brought you into his kingdom and now sees you as a king and priest. He's chosen you. He's called you. He's commissioned you. Four things today we've learned that he can use us is number one is when we separate from the world. And number two, that we want to walk worthy of who we are. Number three is that we become a dependent people on him. And number four, we never lose hope because our God is big today, but bigger tomorrow. Somebody ought to give the Lord a great big hand. <laughs> I'm telling you, it's truth, and it's good, and it's alive. And let Grandpa teach you, it works. My God, it's good. I want you all to remain seated. I don't want anybody to get up I don't want anybody to leave. You've only been in church for an hour. Could you give God a little more of your time than that? Church is not over with yet. When you get up and leave early, I think it's sinful. And I think you'll be held accountable to the Holy Spirit for being rude in the house of God. So as a pastor, I'm trying to teach you some church etiquette before God. 
which is all through scripture. Don't get up. We're not finished yet. Pay attention for the next few moments. God wants to do something. I want to talk to you that think you're going to go to heaven. I want to make sure you are going to go to heaven. If you should walk out of this building today and your heart stopped and you died, bang, and you were dead, would you open your eyes in heaven or would you open your eyes in hell? What makes you think you're going to go to heaven? Your answer to that question says a lot about who you are and where you're at with God. What makes you think you're going to heaven? You say, Pastor Jim, I think I'm going to make it because I'm really a good person. Can I tell you that nowhere in the Bible does it say you get to go to heaven because you're good? You say, Pastor Jim, you don't understand. I, I'm going to go to heaven because I really love God. That's my answer. Nowhere in the Bible says you get to go to heaven because you love God. You say, Pastor Jim, wait a minute, hold on. I want you to know something. I'm going to go to heaven because I just hope I'm going to make it. Nowhere in the Bible says you can hope your way into heaven. Some of you might say to yourself, well, I'm going to go to heaven because my mom and dad told me I was a Christian when I was a kid. Had me christened or baptized when I was a baby. Took me to catechism class or Sunday school or Sabbath school class when I was a child. Can I tell you something? Nowhere in the Bible does it say your mom and dad take you to those classes or do those things, get you to heaven. Maybe even put a cross, say Christopher, around your neck. Guess what? Nowhere it says because you wear religious jewelry or have a bumper sticker on your car, you become a Christian, get to go to heaven. You're not going to make it and somebody needs to tell you. Jesus said, listen to what Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man goes to the Father except by me. That's what Jesus said. In other words, you can't get to heaven any other way but his. No other way but his. You can't get to heaven my way. You can't get to heaven your way. You can't get to heaven some well-meaning church committee's way. You're going to have to get to heaven his way. And he tells us exactly how to get to heaven in the scripture. You say, wait a minute, pastor, hold on. I joined my last church. I was there for years, sang in the choir, helped the pastor, taught Sunday school in that, class, in that church. That's got to mean something. Yep, it does. Thank God you did it, but guess what? It won't get you to heaven. You need to understand that. Nowhere does it say if you join the church, sing in the choir, help the pastor. You get to go to heaven. There's only one way to heaven, and that's Jesus' way. And he tells us in John, the third chapter, you must be born again. Bottom line, when I use the words born again, a lot of people turn off. Immediately say, oh, forget it. The reason you feel that is because Hollywood is portrayed born again people as idiots, fanaticals, and radicals, and goofballs in some movies and some books of magazines have also displayed them that way. But I'm here to tell you something that's not what we're talking about. Let me explain what born again means from the beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible so that you will know. Born again means this, that you have given God all of your heart. You have given God all of your life. You see, it's an all or nothing relationship with Jesus Christ. It always has been, always will be. All or nothing, God forgive us in American churches for watering that down for the last 250 years, but I'll prove it to you, all or nothing. Last book in the Bible, the book of Revelation, Jesus himself is speaking. He says, I'm coming again, and when I come, I better find you hot or I better find you cold, because if I find you lukewarm, I will vomit you from my mouth. What did he just really say? People that are lukewarm are not real Christians at all and they're not going to make it. What's lukewarm? Little in, little out. Little up, little down. Token prayer, occasional church attendance. You're not against God, but you're not wholehearted for God. Watch this. God is something in your life, but he's not everything. That's lukewarm, my friends. 
and a whole society of people that call themselves Christians are lukewarm and they're not going to make it. I don't want that to be you. I want you to be right with God. So today you have a divine appointment with God. You've had a lot of appointments in your life, doctors, attorneys, plumbers, and painters. But here's a divine appointment with God. Today is your day of salvation. And you're going to have to give God all of your heart and give God all of your life. It's an all or nothing relationship with Jesus Christ. And if you haven't given it to him, then let me ask you, how's he going to get it? Is he going to steal it from you? He's not a thief. Is he a conniver to talk you out of your heart and life? Is he a manipulator to make you do this, to hit your head with a two by four until you finally give up? I don't think so. It's your call and your choice. It's your heart and your life. He could have made a trillion robots that look exactly like you, that would worship him forever, but he didn't. He made you, made you unique, and gave you a free will choice. And it's your choice as to whether or not you will give God what he gave you, all of your heart and all of your life. That's what he gave you. Today, we're in this safe and friendly place. We've laughed, we've clapped. You were great listening to the word of God. We've sung songs here. There's no embarrassment in this house. But today is your day of salvation. And you say to me, Pastor Jim, how do I get right with God? Let's do it God's way. Jesus said, if you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my Father. But if you deny me, I'll deny you. In a moment, I'll count to three. I'll go like this. One, two, three, and I'll pop my hands together. I'll go, bang, when you hear that sound. Bang, your hand goes up. I'll see your hand go up, and you can put it right back down all across this auditorium. What you're saying by the raising of your hand is I don't want Jesus in my head like most Americans. See, see, I already know you know who Jesus is. You celebrate Christmas, look at me now, look at me. You celebrate Christmas and Easter every year of your life. I already know you know who Jesus is. It's not about, look at me now, look, look, look. It's not about what you have in your head. It's about what you've done with your heart. This is about your heart. Have you given him all of your heart? Have you given him all of your life? I'm gonna count to three, pop my hands together. Who should raise your hand? If you've been running from God, I'm speaking to you instead of to God. I'm speaking to you. Get ready to put your hand up. If you've never given him all of your heart, I'm speaking to you. Get ready to put your hand up. If you've never given him all of your life, I'm speaking to you. Get ready to put your hand up. If you're not sure, make sure I'm speaking to you. If you've been walking on both sides of the fence, get over it. Let's get on the right side. Today is your day and make that commitment. I'm counting to three, pop my hands together. You say, Pastor, you want me to raise my hand? I'll be embarrassed. Uh-huh, you might be. Get over it. It's better to be embarrassed for a moment than to be in hell forever and ever and ever and ever because you're afraid of what people think instead of what God sees and thinks. Come on, no one's that dumb. Today is your day of salvation, and I will not embarrass you, and neither will God, but God wants you to make a public statement for him because he made a public statement for you. All across this auditorium, I don't want any heads bowed. I don't want any eyes closed. What kind of creepy thing is that, that we have to creep into the kingdom of God? This is with your head up and your eyes open. Before God and every devil in hell, you're going for Jesus, and there's a bunch of you in here that need to get right with God, and today is your day of salvation salvation. Are you ready? Here it is. One, two, three. Let me see your hands. Let me see your hands. There's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, twenty, one, twenty, two, twenty, three, twenty, four, twenty, five, twenty, six, twenty, seven, twenty, eight, twenty, nine, thirty, thirty, one, thirty, two, thirty, three, thirty, four, thirty, five, thirty, six, thirty, seven, thirty, eight, thirty, nine down here somewhere. I, you're pointing down here, but I didn't see it. Thirty nine. Anybody else? Real quick. There's thirty nine. There's, a, where's another one down here? I, there's another one, 40, 41 back there. Thank you. God bless you. There's 42 back there, 43, 44. Thank you. Anybody
Anybody else? There's 45, 46, 47, 48. Thank you back there. Where are you? Anybody else in this house? Going for God. Man, you've been walking on both sides of the fence. It's time to change and get right with God. 40, what, where was I? Where was I? 48, oh, whatever. 49, 50, back over here. God bless you. Anybody else? Anybody else real quick? Let's give the Lord a great big praise for 50 wise people. <laughs> Glory to God. Back in the foyer. Now listen to me. If you raise your hand in the foyer, if you're down the corridors, if you're out in the plaza, you know, those of you that are watching by television in Love Rock Cafe, down at Kuka's Restaurant, get ready. Tell an usher. Get yourself, get your stuff together. Get up here. Now all 50 of you that raise your hand, I want you to get a hold of your coat, purse, sweater, Bible friend. Get your stuff. Get your stuff. Bring a friend. I don't want anybody to leave during this period of time. If you leave, the ushers have instructions to slap the teeth right out of your mouth. And I want every single person that is in here to stay, get right with God that raised their hand and let's welcome them. Everybody stand to your feet and welcome all 50 of you. Get down here right now. Bring your stuff. Bring a friend. Come on. Come on home. Come on home. Come on home. Help them out of the family room. Put a smile on your face. This is a good thing, not a bad thing. You're not going to hell. You're not going to the morgue. You're going to heaven. That ought to make you happy. My goodness sakes, that's good. Now, real quick, I want you to look to your left. See this guy waving at you? His name is Pastor Dave. Pastor Dave's a really good guy. No weird, strange stuff goes on at all. It's going to do three things. Let me tell you what those three things are. Is that okay? That'll make it more comfortable for you. Number one, he's going to lead you in a prayer to invite Jesus into your heart. You gotta invite him in. He doesn't come in because you need him. He went to the cross and died for you because you need him. He comes in because you invite him. He's a gentleman. So you'll invite him in with a prayer. Number two, he's gonna give you some free stuff about what to do next. You know, now that you're a Christian, what does God want you to do? Good question. Here's some free literature. Third grade reading level. How do I know it's third grade? I wrote it. So there is third grade reading level, you know what I'm saying? And so here it is, it's simple, what to do next, follow those instructions. Third thing, he's going to introduce you to a program we have called Spiritual Personal Trainers. What's a spiritual personal trainer? They're friends, we give away friends. Someone will meet you before church service, pray for you for the next few weeks, uh, help you, encourage you, uh, go through some scripture with you. Listen, you said you're going to give God all of your heart. You said you're going to give God all of your life. Let us help you to do that. Don't just come forward in a church, feel the presence of God that drew you, the Holy Spirit drew you, and then go back doing the same old stuff you did before. Let us help you. In fact, if you will give this church one year of your life, just say, I'm going to church every week for a year. I promise you the rest of your life, God will give back to you blessed out of your sauce. Am I right? Am I right? Am I right? It's true. So, you're going to say, oh, I'm going to run back to my old church. Well, how come you didn't get saved at your old church? Come on, let's be honest with each other. In fact, if you'd have been going to your old church today and died, you would have died and gone to hell because you don't get saved by going to church. You get saved when you hear the Holy Spirit and God speaks to your life, which you just did. And so I'm putting in my application to be your pastor. I don't know if anybody's ever done that, but here's my application. And it says, I promise to tell you the truth, not to mess around with you, not to take from you or 
be some egotistical freak in front of you, but just to love you and fight the good fight of faith and pray for you and build a solid, healthy church for you and your family. And that's what this is all about, and it will happen. It only takes a few moments. People you came with will wait for you. Make a left turn. Follow Pastor Dave right over that way. Come on, let's give the Lord a great big praise.